coming and well done to those who signed up on Eventbrite and actually turned up. That's um, not always as common as we might like it to be. Um, I'm Sonia Johnson, I'm a professor at UCL and I'm the director of the Mental Health Policy Research Unit and a lot of the research work that we're going to talk about today was carried out by the Policy Research Unit and people associated with it in order to inform the independent review of the Mental Health Act. And what we particularly want to focus on today, obviously there will be, or hopefully one day when the government has a bit of time to think about something other than the obvious, there will be a, a sort of political and legal process to follow on from the Mental Health Act. What we're particularly interested in talking about today and what we're going to feed back to the Department of Health about following this meeting is the research that should follow on from the review of the Mental Health Act. So we're, there's be a discussion this afternoon throughout the day what we're particularly interested in reflecting on, and we'll also send you a questionnaire about this, is what research is now important? What sort of research could we do straight away with existing sources of data, or with data that would be easy to collect? What sort of review should research should NIHR be commissioning? Basically, we want to think about those next steps, and that's the most important the outcome of the day really because it was clear from the work we did that there are a lot of gaps as I think will become evident through the day so have a think about that through the day and I hope that each one of you who's here will both contribute to the discussions about that this afternoon from which we'll keep notes and that you'll also fill in the questionnaire about priorities that will be circulating to you throughout the day. We expect that actually a very large part of this event will be with Andre, the mental health in the lead, and Saida will be beyond the room, that it'll be out there on social media. All the talks are being recorded and will be available to people on social media. There'll be tweets throughout the day, and if you're so disposed, please do uh, tweet about what you're hearing and join in the discussion on Twitter as well. And here are the two hashtags to use to connect your comments and questions with the general discussion. Okay, I'm chairing throughout the day. I've been trying all this morning to get myself in a particularly ferocious frame of mind because I'm going to be an exceptionally ruthless chair because we've got very tight timing. So whoever you are, no quarter, you're going to stop talking after your allotted time. I have downloaded on my phone a recording of the Ode to Joy, the European anthem. That will start playing as soon as you reach your allotted time. If you go more than 10 seconds over, I'll join in and start <laughs> singing along to it. So be warned. Okay, you, wouldn't, you don't want all that to happen. So, Okay, so without... So, and yeah, just to say, in keeping with that issue about timing, we won't take any questions or comments or interruptions during the speakers, but we've allocated a slot at the end of each session to take questions together then. So please hold your questions and comments until the end of each slot. Okay, so I'd like to introduce, first of all, it's a great pleasure to introduce the, the leader of the independent review, Professor Sir Simon Wesley, who's kindly joined us from the other place over the river, and we're delighted to have him here today. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Sonia. Thank you. Right. Are you recording all this? Are the mics or anything, or am I just... Don't, I'm not mic'd up, but okay, good. Well, I like not being mic'd up, so that's fine. Um, good. So, very nice to see you all. I can't imagine you being fierce, Sonia, actually, I have to say, but I look forward to it. 
I do a lot of work for the armed forces and what they do when you overrun, they have a tactic that uh, when you hit your allocated time, uh, a, a junior NCO stands up behind you and plays a bugle and uh, that's in the morning and if you're up in Scotland they play the bagpipes. I'm not making this up actually, that is what they do and it is impossible, literally impossible to continue with a bugle in your ear or even worse, the bagpipes, it's a ghastly noise. Good, so very nice to be here, very nice to see so many people I recognise from the review. We haven't, it's, it's quite interesting because we finished in December and um, I was advised to you know, take time off uh, from, from all that stuff, which I did. I uh, went on holiday, promptly broke my arm, and so I've actually been out of action for the last uh, three months. And um, this is, the, I think, the first or second time that I've actually thought about, or, or let alone, I had to have a quick read of it on the bus of the review of what we actually said. Um, jolly good it was, actually. Very good. I'm very impressed. Um, but it's been, a, so the last year, I've been completely preoccupied uh, with all this, as you know, and... Um, and I, and I did at the start say, uh, quite correctly, the reason I've been asked to lead the review by the Prime Minister, actually, is she still the Prime Minister? I, I, I'm, I'm serious, I haven't actually checked today. Ten minutes ago. Ten minutes ago she was, was she? Okay. Yeah. Um, that was a kind of running joke during the year, but it's solid. It's not even funny anymore, actually. Ah, I can see Matthew over there. Nice to see you. Um, so... Um, is that you have to show that you don't know anything about the subject, which I, I, I showed very, very clearly and indisputably that I didn't know anything about the subject. And as you'll, if we continue much during the day, you'll find out that actually that's still probably the truth. I know a bit more than I did, but I'm not the expert on this subject at all. And we did rely during the review on all sorts of things, views of, of, of uh, many of the service users, again, recognise lots of familiar faces, and the kind of technical backup that we got from this unit here, particularly from Bryn. Uh, ably assisted by many others and um, and that was incredibly good and I think actually as an academic myself the fact that you've actually churned all your stuff out and I think it's now all published or nearly all or on the way all the way so it just shows what fear does isn't it and funding that you actually can do big pieces of research write them up and get them all published in one year so I think you should do more work for things like this because it's very good for you um, so we, we finished and one of the things people immediately said, can you say what's happened since? Well, the answer is sod all, really, if I'm being honest with you, for all the reasons that we all know. When you land, the, the, the history of these reports is the one thing you dread is ending up on the shelf, and half of all independent reports to government end up on the shelf. Literally, nothing happens as a result, and there was a big follow-up of 500 of these things done by the Institute of Government, which I read, it came out just before we started, and that was absolutely terrifying if you're about to give up your life to this, and you find literally half have absolutely no impact whatsoever <coughs> on anything. And one of the things that, there were various things that predicted that, all of which were quite scary. One was a change of government, so that wasn't very helpful, or a general election. Um, the other was the time you take, and it seems to be the longer you take on a review, the less likely it is to be impactful. That was one of the many reasons why we did decide to keep to time and do it in, in, in the kind of history of Mental Health Act reviews. We hold the Commonwealth UK World Olympic records, um, and it's likely to stay that way, actually. Um, but the longer you take, the less likely you are to have an impact, I think, because time move on, people forget, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, other things have to happen. You need a government to be able to respond very quickly and to accept some key recommendations when you produce, and that did happen. Um, you need them to say the kind of things you need to hear, that, for example, uh, in this sit, what we absolutely wanted was a commitment to move to legislation, which we had. And normally then, a group of civil servants would then be tasked to put that together. Uh, you all know um, what all the civil servants are doing at the moment. So Matthew, why aren't you, why aren't you on Brexit then? Are you the only one who isn't? No, you're on it, are you? Oh, bloody hell. Okay, yeah. I'm on Brexit. You are, you're on Brexit. Okay, everyone's on Brexit. So, so the problem is there isn't a civil service and there isn't a government. Um, we have been in touch um, with ministers uh, number 10 in so much, again, as they exist. Um, but we hope that when sanity is resumed and restored, um, then uh, we will be back on track. And there's nothing that we've heard that suggests that it won't be the reception that the report got from all the various quarters that we needed to get approval was there. Everybody, of course, had caveats. It didn't go far enough. Where's the money? Where's the judges? All of those things, all of which are livable with. Um, but 
the reception that was received by the political parties. In fact, it was the only thing in December that all the parties agreed on. If you look at Prime Minister's questions when, when the Prime Minister talked about this, um, the reaction from all the House was very positive. Uh, and, and, and indeed, um, bizarrely, and really bizarrely, the, the committee that was then looking at the MCA, which was extremely split, the only thing they agreed on was to send me best wishes when they <coughs> discovered I'd broken my arm. And that was the only thing that they could all agree on. Um, so we, we, we are, as we say, we're in slight stasis, but I am reasonably confident, and obviously one can never be totally confident, but I'm reasonably confident that we did enough things, said enough things that, that were obviously right, um, obviously needed to be done by whoever is in power, which of whichever political complexion they are, I don't think that matters, um, to ensure that we will move on to the next step and get uh, our key uh, recommendations implemented. And I think it would be quite difficult now for any government of any colour to actually, actually impede that to get in the way. That's not to say that things will not go wrong, they will. It's not to say that everything that we wanted will happen. That's the other thing. No review ever has achieved everything it wanted and, and we, ours weren't either. But so long as we get our core things through, I think we'll make a difference. Um, connected also linked to the 10-year the forward view, which we did know about and did ensure that our recommendations and theirs were interdigitated as they are. And uh, we will continue to, to work with NHS England on that in particular to ensure that one thing we can't do in a mental health act review is, talk, is funding, but we will push for um, the money we need to regenerate our um, estate, as it were, will be a priority uh, in the spending review, if there is one. Um, so um, that's all I'm going to say, actually. So I'm not going to listen to the ode to joy. And actually, I will take <laughs> questions. Have I got time? I've got yeah. time. Good. Yeah, I've got a question. Good. Let's see what Rethink Mental Illness is. I'm sorry? Rethink Mental Illness. Yeah. Was you there? Yeah. Yeah, I was Were they there? Yes, absolutely. Um, Alex was a key part ago. of the review, uh, mm -hmm. one of the core people. And, uh, and in fact, can I just thank the Rethink? I haven't seen it. Alex, I can't see it. But anyway, Rethink have been already very, and, and that's the kind of thing I mean that that the, the major organisations um, would be extremely put out if we don't make good on the promises and rethink have already been campaigning on that and I'm very grateful to them. That it? Brilliant. More questions oh. for Simon. Fabulous. Yeah. Ah. Did, um, one of the things that uh, struck me as uh, incongruous um, Mm -hmm. um, and right with the run that he from the outset of the day, which you said we're not going to yep. do that. Um, and at the end of it, you said we're not going to, to do that. Correct. In the yes. Um, I'll start. Um, uh, I haven't heard anything from them say, oh, we're not, we're not happy about this. Um, no. Have, if, yes, it was in Congress. Um, have um, any of the parties come back to the review and said, oh, this is what we're happy with? This is I, I think that every, all political parties are in the crisis and stasis at the moment, and who knows what the end results will be and precisely what the political landscape will look. I think it will look utterly different in 12 months' time. What I don't think will be different is um, the, our recommendations on CRPD. Um, we did get support from Labour, uh, who knew what we were doing. It was quite difficult to work with them at times, but nevertheless, that's what we got, and we, got, we did get um, the main recommendations welcomed. Um, and also on private communications that I'm not going to elaborate on, um, I'm quite sure that that's the case. I don't think actually senior Labour people quite knew what it was that they'd committed themselves to, and I find it very difficult that any UK Parliament would go through on the full recommendations of the implementation group for CRPD. We explained in great detail why that is. Nothing I've heard has changed my mind. What I think we have done, and I know Dorothy A will disagree, and that's fine, but what we have done is move that forward along the same agenda, but we have not gone as far as that would suggest, and there are very, very, I think, and we've not pretended that was because there isn't parliamentary time, which there isn't, 
Uh, but we haven't pretended that. We've said very clearly we don't think that would be the right thing to do, and we don't. Any more questions now? We can also group questions together at the end of this session, as we were going to do. OK, well, let's keep a bit more yeah. time for Brilliant. questions at the end. Thank Fabulous. you very Good. much, Simon. <laughs> now have five brief presentations of the research that was carried out for the Mental Health Act review. Um, <coughs> just introduce each speaker quite briefly in view of time. So first up is Susie Walker, Dr. Susie Walker, who's a consultant child and adolescent <coughs> psychiatrist and also an NIHR research fellow and I'm delighted to have her as my PhD student at UCL. So I'd like to speak to you today about our very nearly finished um, <laughs> systematic review and meta-analysis on the clinical and social factors associated with an increased risk of involuntary psychiatric care. Um, so we know that involuntary psychiatric care is used worldwide and we also know that there is no country that's ever introduced it and then taken it away despite sort of growing concerns about the ethics of its use and its clinical utility. Um, but it's, it's condoned in international human rights legislation such as the Human Rights Act and there are strict criteria everywhere it's used to say under what circumstances you can or cannot be detained. And for example in the UK you have to have a mental disorder of a nature or degree so it has to be quite severe, warranting detention in hospital and you have to be thought to be a risk to your own self your own health or the safety of others. So it's really quite clear, quite strict guidelines on why it can be used. However, we know that despite this, despite these, you know, you have to fit into these criteria, there are rising rates of compulsion in most countries. There are really wide international variations and we'll hear a bit more about that later. So some countries have much <coughs> higher rates of involuntary admissions than others. We also know there are massive international differences. So some hospitals have much higher rates of detention than other hospitals within the same country, even within the same town. And that's worldwide as well. And again, we know there are varying rates of detention between different population subgroups. So despite these strict criteria, it seems that we're all equally likely to be detained, <coughs> but some are more equally likely to be detained than others. So we wanted to know why this might be. So what did we want to know? So what are the factors that make you more likely to be admitted to hospital against your will than sort of voluntarily? And from the literature we realised that there were several different factors which may contribute to this. So individual factors like your gender or your diagnosis. There could be service factors like the availability of beds or community care. And area factors, so sort of the level of deprivation in the area in which you live. So we wanted to look at all of these. And why does it matter? Well, until we know who's at risk of get, getting detained, we don't know where to target our interventions. How do we stop these rising rates of, uh, rising rates of detentions? If they are varying, if rates are varying, it means there's unequal access to care, and we need to know why that's happening or what's happening so we can get a better understanding of it. And thirdly, we, you know, we really need to try and clarify why are these massive differences between hospitals and between countries? So if we find out the risk factors, maybe that will throw some light onto that. So how we did it, slowly, well, quickly, <laughs> but it's, it took, it's still going, we're nearly done. We used four um, uh, databases from 1983 to the present day. We looked at all studies <coughs> that compared involuntary hospitalizations with voluntary hospitalizations <coughs> in the populations. We did a quality analysis and data extraction, discussed with our members of the lived experience working group, and then did a meta-analysis where we could, and where we couldn't, we did a narrative synthesis. And just very briefly, our search through uh, over 6,000 studies, we reviewed 176 whole texts, and finally included 68 studies in the review. So it's quite a big um, analysis. So what did we find? So I don't think it would be a, a massive surprise, some of the first findings 
We found that you're more likely to get detained if you're male, you're single, in receipt of social benefits, have a psychotic disorder, and if you had a previous involuntary admission, and that seemed to be the biggest risk factor. In terms of the narrative synthesis, we found that those who were more severely unwell were detained, which would then fit in with the criteria, which is what we might expect. Those who were perceived to be at a risk to others were of a much higher risk of being detained involuntarily <coughs> than others. And interestingly, risk to self did not seem to be associated with involuntary care. So there were quite mixed findings on that, which we thought was quite interesting given the, the criteria, particularly in the UK and worldwide. In terms of service factors, so some studies have just suggested that um, availability of beds might be related to risk of involuntary admission. Well, we didn't really find that, but what we found is that police involvement in admission had made you significantly more at risk of being detained involuntarily. And again, we don't know why particularly, but that was just what we found. And there were very few studies that looked at this, but there is some evidence that the availability of alternative community services reduced the risk of an involuntary admission. One study found that the availability of home visits after 10 p.m. reduced the number of Section 2 admissions Another study found that increased rates of home visits reduced rates of detention in that area, but very, very limited data, and no data on bed availability, no indication that more inpatient beds led to fewer involuntary admissions. What we did find was GP involvement was associated with voluntary hospitalisation, so those who went to their GP first and then were referred on to hospital were more likely to end up being admitted voluntarily than involuntarily. Again, probably not surprising, but definitely came out in the literature. Um, I don't know if anyone recognises this. It was the town that caused some scandal. It's a uh, Jaywick in Essex, but it was used in the Trump um, campaign about poverty in the UK. Um, but this is the town in the UK. And we did find some evidence in our study of an association between higher levels of deprivation and higher rates of involuntary admission. There were, again, very few studies, only three from the UK, but they were moderate to high quality, and they found an association between higher rates of deprivation with higher rates of involuntary admission. Um, we've, had, we've had some initial thoughts from um, one of the members of our lived experience working group who preferred not to be mentioned by name, um, but they thought that um, that actually involuntary and voluntary hospitalizations can be very similar from the perspective of the service user. So you can be admitted voluntarily, but actually feel like you're being detained because you're not actually allowed to leave. And so that that would perhaps we should something we should be thinking about in future research. Um, this notion of risk is very problematic, so how is it defined and assessed? And again, the notion of insight, which came up a bit. So could lack of insight actually be interpreted as not really in agreement with the clinician, which is interesting for me to think of as a clinician, so it's really helpful to us. So what are the implications? Well, we've got potential target groups now for interventions to reduce involuntary admissions, particularly those who've been detained before. We can really now think, well, we need to focus on these people that are at really high risk of another detention, especially if they have some of the other risk factors that we've identified. What we didn't find out, or what we weren't able to unpick, were the mechanisms behind these risk factors. Why, if you're a man, are you more likely to be detained? Why, if you've got psychosis? Why are some people with psychosis more likely to be detained than others? Those sort of questions we weren't able to answer. And again, we didn't really find anything in our study that would really explain why there are these massive international variations, because more men are detained in each country. It doesn't really, really explain that, so we need to find out a bit more about that. So in terms of future research, what's needed? Well, large-scale perspective research, multi-level, multi-variable models, so we can start to try and unpick some of these things that we found and find out why, why they're happening. We definitely need some qualitative work, thinking about patient experiences, that sense of voluntary, involuntary, what does that really mean and how can we improve that? And clinical decision making, why is it that certain doctors and clinicians make the decision in certain situations and what is it that guides and influences that decision? 
And one thing particularly of interest to me is identifying risk factors in children and adolescents. When do these risk factors become risk factors and are they the same in children as they are in adults? So in summary, this is the first international systematic review and meta-analysis on this subject. Um, we've identified that there are factors outside someone's psychopathology that influence their risk <coughs> of being involuntarily hospitalised, such as gender, being on benefits, but we haven't really found out why. Um, previous involuntary hospitalisation appears to be the main risk factor for a future involuntary hospitalisation, so this gives us an important target group to focus on. And we were interested to find that most of the studies explored clinical presentations and individual level demographics, and not many looked at the social factors, so there's a lot of work to be done there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great timekeeping. So I'd like now to introduce Dr. Laddie Smith, who is a consultant psychiatrist and also had a major role in the Independent Review of the Mental Health Act as Vice Chair of the African Caribbean Focused Group in that review process. And she's, you've noticed that Susie didn't talk about ethnic factors, and that's because they were subject of the separate review that Laddie's going to tell you about. Okay, so thank you very much for um, asking me to speak. I have got a lot of slides, and I speak very quickly, so I'm going to apologise to you, but I think these slides should be available to anyone uh, who wants to have them later on. But the background is this. Uh, black, Asian, minority ethnic people are more likely to, admit it, to be admitted involuntarily, have longer inpatient stays, uh, more readmissions, um, but some studies say there's a weak association between being uh, from a BME background and being admitted compuls um, and compulsory admission. And there's some evidence that the risk of compulsory admission is different in different in people from different ethnic backgrounds. But we do know that there are higher rates of detention in the Mental Health Act for um, black people. We, less, we know less about people from South Asian backgrounds. And lots of people, there have been lots of explanations. Some, uh, we've heard, for example, that uh, people um, with, um, people from black um, backgrounds are much more likely to have uh, schizophrenia. That uh, it might be because people from BME backgrounds are less aware of, of mental health issues. Um, that people might have had adverse experiences with mental health services and so don't don't present. And also people have said that there's the problem with healthcare providers is that they're in, inherently and institutionally racist. And, that, um, and actually they've had direct experience of racism when they have presented. And so people said that there are, that's why we get differential use of mental health services. The problem is that a lot of the explanations that are provided seem to have little supporting evidence. So what we want to do was to, essentially what we did was uh, repeat a systematic review that was done um, uh, around ethnicity and detention, something that was done by um, a professor called Cam Bury. Um, we updated that review, but also um, expanded it. Uh, we looked at not only England and Wales, but we looked at international cities as well. And um, we wanted to also focus on some of the explanations that are seen for the disparity in um, mental health detention. And we wanted to also um, consider the experience of migrant populations full stop, not simply about ethnicity, but also about uh, whether, someone, whether migrant populations have an increased risk of detention. Um, essentially, essentially, we were particularly interested in compulsory admission to hospital, these are our outcomes, compulsory readmission, because that implies you've had some experience of the um, mental health services already, and also inpatient length of stay. We um, looked at the quality of the studies, and this is because some studies are better than others. But the findings of studies, studies that may be of low quality, might be used to determine policy, and we need to think about that very carefully. Not only did we look at the overall quality of the, the methodological quality of the studies, we also looked at the quality of the ethnic specificity in the studies. And what I mean by that is this. So I'm looking around the room, and there are people of different ethnicities in the room. Now, I could look at everybody and say, well, there were some white people and there were some black people, and there's 
couple of Asian people. But each person will say that their ethnicity, they're not just black, they're not just white. You might be black African, you might be black West African, you might be black Caribbean, you might be black Caribbean from St. Lucia, which is different to, in culturally from being black Caribbean from Jamaica. But, what, but there's a tendency to lump people together according to the color of their skin, particularly in research. So we wanted to, some people have actually worked out kind of better ways of doing this, and we wanted to look at the ethnic specificity in the studies to see whether that had any bearing on our findings. So, um, and then, very importantly, we looked at explanations for the differences in detention of the different BME groups. Um, just to say that um, the explanations we were interested in was whether or not they were drawn from primary evidence, i.e. data that the paper presided itself. You know, that the, the research has, has found. We also separated out the explanations into five different domains, patient-related, illness-related, service-related, um, culture-related, and then service-patient-interface-related. Um, I won't go into that, actually, because I've got lots of um, slides, but we whistled down over 9,500 studies to actually it was 71 studies. Um, and uh, frankly, there was a high variability in the study quality and there was a high variability in the scores on the FST checklist. A, 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 I, I would urge you to read this paper. It's now out in the Lancet Psychiatry. If you get a chance, please have a look at it. This is a bit of a busy slide, but essentially what we found was this. Unsurprisingly, if you are from a BAME background or if you are a migrant, you are much more likely to be detained under the Mental Health Act than if you are from a white British background or from the majority um, ethnic background in a particular country or if you are a non-migrant. And um, at the top of this slide, I haven't got a pointer actually, no, no pointer, but at the top of this slide, are the black groups, and the, the best we could do was separate people into black African, black Caribbean, and black unspecified. And that's when people talked about black other, and we're a bit vague about it in the paper. So this is based on the papers that we found. Essentially, um, if you were uh, from a black African or black Caribbean background, you're up to two and a half times more likely to be detained than if than, um, the, I say, white majority population. If you were from a South Asian background, and that included um, Indian people, Pakistani people, uh, Bengal Bengali people, um, Nepalese people, then you were about one, one and a third times more likely to be detained. And if you were East Asian, very small um, number of studies, but just over two times likely to be detained. And being a migrant also increased your likelihood of being detained by one and a half times. And when it came to readmission, if you were from a black Caribbean background, you were much more likely to be readmitted than any of the other ethnic groups. Now that's particularly telling, because it says what on earth is going on, particularly for people from those backgrounds when, it, when they go into services. There's something different to even all the other black groups of people. Um, this, this slide actually just, what we did then was to actually look at just the high quality studies. And when we looked at the high quality studies, guess what, still the same findings essentially, although it wasn't, it wasn't quite the same for people from South Asian backgrounds, but we had very, a very small number of studies. I'm not gonna go into that one, far too busy. Um, just to say actually that the proportion of females in um, the study increased the likelihood, uh, did have it, was, was associated with um, how likely people from a particular ethnic background were to be detained. And also publication date was important. <coughs> so we found that the more recent studies were associated with lower rates of detention in different ethnic groups. And there was still, you're still much more likely to be detained, but we do wonder if whether that might be that people are improving or it might be simply that the studies are just better quality studies. Very importantly, and this is the bit that interests me most, um, 37 studies, that's almost half of the studies that we looked at, offered about at least one explanation supported by primary evidence, which means that half of the studies offered no, offered no evidence, thank you, offered no evidence for um, the explanations that they gave. Now that's really important because essentially 21 studies offered explanations that were unsupported by primary evidence. 
So what they were doing was saying, right, we found really high rates of detention in black men from Caribbean and African backgrounds, and we think it's because, and I'll show you some of the reasons, we think it's because they're probably more violent or because they're more psychotic or because they don't, they don't understand that they're ill. They've got no insight. But they didn't provide any evidence for that. They literally just decided. Maybe they made it up. They just put it in there. But that was used as a reason for why people um, might be detained. This is actually the table of, we, we, we separated, we were able to separate the um, explanations into, there was kind of 24 different types of explanations, if you like. And you'll see that the, at the top, these are, these are explanations that had no supporting evidence at all. In the middle, there's a mixture of supportive and contradictory evidence. And at the bottom, these were uh, explanations that did have some support from the primary evidence from the data. So the ones that were given as uh, reasons, but there's no evidence for, higher rates of comorbid drug use in BME people, no evidence for that, uh, poorer detection, diagnosis and referral for mental illness, no evidence for that, greater stigma in BME people, there was no evidence for that, illness expect expressed as violence, there was no evidence of that, and so on. Evidence that, um, explanations that were supported by evidence included poor adherence to treatment, residential instability, um, BME perceptions of mental illness and services. Again, I would say please have a look at the, um, you know, the paper. But essentially, we know black people are much more likely to be involuntarily admitted compared to white patients. Also South Asian and East Asian patients um, and migrant groups. 47% of the 71 patient papers offered no explanation of the disparate risks or only offered explanations that were unsupported by primary evidence. And you have to ask yourself, what is the scientific merit of employing a study design that's inadequate to explore your explanatory factors? The reason this is problematic is this. Some of these papers are 30 odd years old. They gave an explanation that, that was then used in the next paper to decide what um, someone should research. So these incorrect Erroneous explanations were being propagated again and again and again. Sonia's looking at me now, she's giving me hard looks. So, <laughs> I'm just gonna um, just very quickly say this, that using assumptions about people in combined groups, i.e. calling everyone who's black, black, it stops further inquiry into the, the differences that each of the people in those groups might be subjected to. Because you black, black, the Caribbean black experience is different the evidence shows it's different to the experience of African, Carib uh, African black people, for example. Untested explanations tend to deal with demographic bound assumptions about, in, about minority ethnic groups, for example, more drug use and greater community stigma about mental health. And that's problematic again because it just propagates, frankly, institutionalised and structural discriminatory ideas about certain groups which just might not be correct. So there were lots of problems with the research, particularly there's, poor, there's not enough data, there are inappropriate ethnic equivalences, simplistic methodologies, and of course the retention of untested explanations, which entrench narratives of racial determinism. This is work that you don't do on your own. The people here who did this were Feely Barnett, Ewan Mackay, Hannah Matthews, who's not with us anymore, and Becky, Becky Gate and Kevin Ario, who, are, who is here. I just want to say thank you very much for um, doing this work. It was really important, and I really hope that you go away, look at this paper, Lancet Psychiatry, March 2019. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Laddie. And I think each time we're, people are not necessarily acknowledging all co-authors on their work. There were many, but we're just, for reasons of time, sometimes rushing through. Okay, so next, very pleased to welcome Megan Pritchard, who has a leading role with the CRIS system for analysing routine data at the at SLAM, and she's going to present another piece of the jigsaw of evidence about who gets detained. You have to questions you. No, you don't. Um, just at the end, though, we'll, uh, we'll keep all the questions until all the speakers are finished. Hold on, 
Follow on, you don't. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, thanks very much for having me. Um, just to say, I'm kind of representing uh, Sean Oram and uh, Richard Hayes, who led um, the work on this at uh, South London Morsley and at Camden and Islington. Um, so, what I want to do is talk briefly through the aims and methods of what we did. And um, at two secondary mental health care providers in London, so that's South London and Maudsley and at Camden and Islington, um, what we were aiming to do was kind of tease out some of the um, findings that sort of detention rates are rising and understand whether that is uh, because there are more people being detained or whether it's because actually more people are being re-detained. And I think to date, sort of national data hasn't really been able to tease that out. Um, so we were aiming to use the CRIS systems at both of those trusts, um, which I'll explain a bit now, to try and get to the bottom of that. So the clinical record interactive search system is in place at um, both Camden Lissington and South London Morsley. I've included a map of London in case anybody is not familiar with where they are. The green is South London and Morsley, <coughs> and the yellow is Camden Lissington, obviously. Um, so. At both of those trusts, we've got an electronic medical record system, which is trust-wide, and the clinical record active interactive search enables de-identified um, access to those clinical records um, for research and audit, and um, that sort of sits within a governance model, which is enabling us to kind of do that in a way that protects the legal and ethical rights of service users whose data is in there. So, as a a bit of info in terms of about the trust, in terms of the base populations of both of those covered by both of those trusts, and in terms of the total records for service users that are contained within them. So, um, South London Morsley, about 340,000 service users' um, medical records are available within the Chris instance there, and in Camden Islington, about 127,000. Um, so, some kind of key points from uh, the methods that we used. So we included only working age adults um, who'd received active care at Camden Lisington or SLAM at any point during the financial year. And that those people that were registered um, as a resident either by their own residential address or their GP's address in um, either of the two catchment areas, we felt that some of the kind of national and specialist services, um, the uh, people, the needs of the service users that uh, from those areas might um, be slightly different. So for this analysis, we've just kept it for the people that were resident within those two catchment areas. And what we've done is we've defined um, detention episodes. So there may be many sort of mental health act sections within one detention episode. Um, so if there was kind of less than one day um, break between uh, one section and another, we defined that as a single detention episode. And we, but we point to note we haven't included any detentions to private hospitals in this analysis. So, um, in terms of the results, I've kept the colour scheme the same as I did on the previous slide. So green is South London and Morsley, and yellow Camden and Islington. So we found that over the observation period, which for South London and Morsley was from 2007 to 2017, and for Camden and Islington 2009 to 2016, there was an increase in the detention episodes per year at both trusts. Um, however, so from South London Morsley, you can see there was a from 33% uh, change increase um, in the number of detention episodes um, over the time period, and a 13% increase in Camden and Islington. But at the same time, there was also an increase in um, the number of patients that were actually being uh, that were actually active within the trust at the time. So an increase of 17% in South London Morsley over the observation period, and an increase of 25% um, of patients uh, in uh, Camden and Islington. So overall, the proportion of uh, service users that were detained um, actually remained relatively uh, stable um, over the time. So an increase of 0.5% um, in uh, South London and Morsley and a decrease of 0.4% Camden and Islington. 
Um, so that's the results for aim one, which was are more people being detained? In terms of aim two, which was looking at whether it's the same people that are being re-detained. Um, in fact, the mean number of detention episodes per patient each year actually remained between 1.1 and 1.3 detention episodes per, per, per patient across the observation period. And in terms of looking at um, the duration of detention, in the South London and Morsley data, there was no real pattern that we could see across the observation period in terms of length of detention. Um, so I've just included the Camden and Islington data here, which showed that over that period, there was an increase from about 92.2 days in 2009 um, up to 130.7 days for um, each detention episode in 2015-2016. Um, so, kind of points to discuss from here. Obviously, um, there, there was an increase in the detention episodes. Um, that's actually less pronounced than has been reported in national data. And I think that that potentially lends a bit of weight to one of the, the themes pulled out by the um, CQC in terms of um, concerns that actually there may be some of the, the increase in detention rate may be accounted for by more completeness of data in recent times and potentially a risk of double counting. Um, so obviously there's also um, a, been an increase in the number of people um, that are being seen um, by each of these services and um, that means it's only been a modest change in the proportion of patients who are um, being detained. Um, in the sort of uh, stats from the CQC again have said that about there's been about a 14% increase in the population of both of these areas of London um, in the observation period. So um, this is, however, though observational research, and at the moment the, the analysis don't account for any potential um, confounding factors. So I think what, um, lending kind of weight to the idea that we need to investigate this a little bit further, um, the lived experience working group has, have had a look at these findings and you know, have said that although it's positive that um, the number of detentions uh, per individual didn't increase over time, at both sites the number of detentions did and at one site the mean length of detentions also increased. And Given the significant social disruption and how rarely detention is experienced as therapeutic or helpful, we really need to be to better understand this trend and um, with an aim to reverse it. So um, the suggestion from the working group is to um, investigate more deeply the reasons for it. So for example, any changes there's been in service provision, any socioeconomic factors between the two sites which have changed during the observation period. Um, so in terms of our next steps, the, um, there is sort of future work planned um, with this data set, looking at kind of multivariable analysis um, to investigate those drivers of change, and um, with a view to also kind of replicating this analysis in trusts outside London, um, which may be um, quite a different um, uh, demographically um, to the two kind of central London areas that we've been looking at. Um, I think a key factor in this obviously has been um, the use of the CRIS system, which I think would be, um, if we are able to replicate it uh, somewhere in other areas where there's also um, a similar system, it enables us to kind of look at those detention episodes in the context of um, an individual patient's journey and enable us to kind of have a look at longitudinal data for each patient in terms of investigating things like uh, um, well, other demographic, demographic and clinical factors, so severity of illness, um, medication use, other hospitalisations that people may have experienced. Um, so, I'm guessing the signal. So, it's been a team effort. Um, so, uh, there's a lot of people being involved with this, and a lot of um, these people planning on investigating this further in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much. Obviously very frightening because people are keeping quite well to time, so thank you for that. So next is Luke Sheridan Rains, who's a senior researcher in the UCL arm of the Mental Health Policy Research Unit, and he's going to talk about a rather heroic 
piece of work <laughs> that he's led over the last year or so, trying to unpick the international picture in terms of compulsory admissions. Um, yeah, so we looked at uh, how rates of compulsory admission to hospital uh, in England compared internationally. We looked at uh, 22 countries across much of Europe, uh, as well as the United Kingdom and Australia and New Zealand. And uh, we basically looked at official government statistics related to the number of people in this country who be subject to the Mental Health Act or the equivalent thereof in other countries, basically. Um, <coughs> what we found was there is a very wide variation in the numbers of people being detained per 100,000 population. So at the top you have Austria, which is around 280 per 100,000 population. At the bottom you have Italy, which is about 15 per 100,000 population. We also tried to look at how this variation might be explained, but uh, to kind of tell you the conclusion, uh, it isn't very clear, basically. Um, the other thing that we, we looked at, because we looked at 10 years of data, quite a few of the countries are seeing a rise in the number of people being detained per 100,000 population. So that's uh, a place like England uh, and France uh, are seeing a rise, whereas other countries are seeing uh, a gradual decrease. So um, Norway and uh, Finland are seeing a kind of general decrease. That is also something that we try to sort of kick apart a bit and, and take a look at, but again, uh, it isn't very clear what, why exactly that's happening. So one of the things we looked at was the association with um, rates of involuntary hospitalization internationally and legislation. So we, we created profiles for each of the different countries uh, of the legislation in that, country, in, the, in that country, and we had it checked by key informants um, uh, based in each of the different countries. And we looked at these different areas of the law. So things like uh, whether it's a medic or a medical professional or a judge that makes the decision to uh, detain someone, um, what uh, arrangements there are for patients' uh, right to appeal, etc. And we grouped the countries, you know, we, we did a bit of analysis with this, but it was quite a simple analysis. But what we did was we grouped the countries based on these different uh, sort of categories. You know, for example, whether it's a medic or whether it's a, a judge that makes the decision. And we didn't notice any uh, systematic differences, basically, in rates of involuntary hospitalization based on this fairly sort of uh, simple analysis. However, of course, there is a relationship with legislation. And I think that what our analysis points to is that uh, it's, much, it's, it's much more complex than sort of making small changes basically in legislation. That we need to take into account things like uh, the social context in which legislation is being used, and I think that we also need to uh, consider the way that it's actually being implemented in practice. Um, okay, so let's. Yeah. We also looked at the sort of social, social economic, and demographic. Uh, Sort of differences between countries to look at whether or not these could potentially explain some of the variation. We found that in general, wealthier countries had slightly higher rates of involuntary hospitalization, and countries with more inpatient uh, psychiatric sort of service provision also had higher rates of involuntary hospitalization. And our explanation for this is that um, it looks like wealthier countries tend to spend more uh, on uh, healthcare, full stop really, uh, which includes more inpatient psychiatric services as a very general rule uh, and where there are more services there are more or higher rates of involuntary hospitalization. However this was a general uh, rule that we found internationally and within countries the picture can be quite different. So within England for example over the last 10 years the number of psychiatric beds per 100,000 has been declining while at the same time the numbers of people being detained have been rising. So while it's a kind of, um, appears to be generally true internationally, again, we need to understand or the sort of social context and what's going on in specific countries is, is actually very important for understanding the relationship between something like number of psychiatric beds and number of people being detained. So overall, um, rates of involuntary hospitalization vary very widely 
and we don't really know why. One, some of the things that we couldn't look at in this work included things like uh, how clinical practice differs, particularly around the sort of thresholds around uh, when a clinician thinks it's appropriate to detain someone. We also couldn't really look at the alternatives to involuntary hospitalization. So things that wouldn't necessarily be make it into the data. Uh, in this country, we have CTOs. Um, but uh, we did look at legislation, and there is you know, some, some differences in legislation, um, but we didn't find any kind of a clear pattern around involuntary hospitalization. Finally, we found some evidence that in general, wealthier countries uh, with higher GDP and lower absolute poverty tend to have higher rates of involuntary hospitalization, while greater uh, inpatient psychiatric services also tend to have um, higher rates of involuntary hospitalization. And uh, I kept my presentation short, as uh, I expected. Um, you know, I knew that there were four other people speaking. <laughs> Say just very quickly, um, these were the key informants that helped us with the project. Uh, so experts in each of the different countries that helped us um, with collecting data and uh, uh, identifying the legislation. Does, is that about the guest Wi-Fi? Yeah. Is it functioning down here? No. Okay. And okay. Nigel said that unfortunately we can't organise it. So. Right, okay. I have many apologies that we apparently <coughs> can't get access to guest Wi Fi at the moment here. All right, so final one of this series of talks is Dr. Bryn Lloyd Evans, who is the Deputy Director of the Mental Health Policy Research Unit at UCL and led our work on the Mental Health Act and was also embedded in the, the group at the Department of Health. And he's going to try and bring all this together, basically. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. So a really broad question to try and address, and I guess understanding why the rates of detention are going up in England is a fairly fundamental question for the Mental Health Act review and for more generally thinking what could be done about that. Um, but as we found, it's a hugely complex question and not an easy one to answer. Um, so just to be clear, first of all, this is a sort of phenomenon we were seeking to understand. The important line in this busy graph is the top blue one, which is showing the overall rate of detentions in hospital in England from sort of 1988, which is the first good point we could get comparable data to 2016. And two points about this, I think. First of all, it's gone up a lot, so it's more than doubled in that time. But it hasn't gone up completely in a sort of uniform rise. And particularly in the, this decade, it's shot up, and we've got, I think, I think behind France, the second highest rate of, of rising of detentions in Europe over this decade. So it's going up a long, a long way. And that's not any sort of explicit aim of policy, is it? This is something that's happening that we don't really intend or understand why. So what we were sort of tasked with trying to do was, first of all, to sort of gather together what are the explanations that have been put forward for why the rates of detentions are going up. And we borrowed quite a lot from the consultations and the evidence calls in the Mental Health Act Review and the work that the CQC have done as well on this topic. Then gather what data then and evidence and research evidence is available to try and <coughs> test these hypotheses as far as we can, which ones are plausible, which ones are supported by evidence. And if we can, put all that together in some kind of explanatory model to show how these things fit together. So that's what we were aiming to do. Um, just to sort of say, we did borrow quite a lot on the good work that the CQC have already done and they'd already kind of put um, explanations into these four categories of sort of societal factors, service factors, legal factors, and data recording ones. And that was a really kind of helpful framework to start from. Um, you always have to have a limitation slide, don't you? The, the main paper we've got isn't, is one of the ones that's not out yet. It's growing into a huge beast with a sort of 90-page appendix at the moment. I was told I, I wasn't allowed 90 slides. You'll be perhaps pleased to know. But even that, it was sketchy. We were doing what we can, but we haven't systematically reviewed literature, and it's entirely possible we've, we've missed some things that we would like to have found. <coughs> and I suppose more generally, we've been able to sort of look about how far thing, things seem to be associated with the rise in rates, but trying to tease out what's just a sort of coincidence and what's co a causal connection is really tricky at times, as I'll go on to. 
Okay, so what I'm going to do, first of all, is just um, start with three things that we think might be contributing to the rising rates from the, from the available evidence. And the first is this kind of cha changing legal approaches. So certainly before the Mental Capacity Act, before deprivation of liberty safeguards were then broken, um, brought in in 2008 and subsequent case law, if somebody was not objecting to going into hospital, but they lacked sort of capacity to make decisions about going in, they might typically have been brought in voluntarily with a sort of soft coercion approach. Um, and that's increasingly not the case now, especially with case law ending with a sort of Cheshire West case in 2014. That really doesn't happen anymore. Now, we were trying to sort of look about, well, how much impact might this make? And there's a good study by Gareth Owen and colleagues just in one hospital, so a quite fairly small study, showing sort of what proportion of people before deprivation of liberty safeguards really came in were kind of non-objecting people who might lack capacity to agree to being admitted. And about 20% of people admitted to hospital might fit that bill back before, before in 2006-07. Now cut forward to 2016, which is the last year we had really good data for, there are about 100,000 hospital admissions. So 20% of those would be 20,000, but in fact we only found 4,000 people being admitted under these dull safeguards, which is basically the alternative to being detained under the Mental Health Act. So this is a big extrapolation, which is sort of hanging quite a lot on one study, but potentially as many as 16,000 non-objecting patients who lack decision-making capacity, who might previously have been admitted voluntarily and now being detained under the Mental Health Act. And that's enough in itself, basically, to explain the rise since 2010. So this is potentially, if we can extrapolate from this one study, that's, that's a huge potential contributory factor. What else do we know? Well, one thing that might be going on is actually mental health services and services generally getting a bit better about identifying people who meet criteria for detention. So we know from sort of the international work we did that generally high-income countries with extensive mental health services detain more people. And another thing we know is that in England the number of people seen by mental health services has risen hugely since in the last sort of 15 years or so. It's almost doubled, I believe. And that's even excluding IAPT. The raise is still big within sort of secondary mental health services. So mental health services are, are, are sort of seeing more people when they're unwell. We know that the police are also bringing people to health services when they're unwell under place of safety orders more, so people who might previously have ended up going through the criminal justice system or actually not receiving any care are now increasingly being brought to, to, to health services. So potentially, identification of need for detention is just something that's improving. Now this next slide will sound contradictory, I don't think it actually is, but at the same time, another thing that could well be going on is that actually community services are getting really stretched. So, in fact, sort of spending on mental health care um, has gone up slightly, even when you adjust for inflation and population rises. But the number of pe people seen by community mental health services has risen hugely. So what that means is actually the money available to spend on any individual patient who's being seen by services has gone down. So more money in general, but less per patient. So, and what we know from the little data we've got, for instance, in community mental health teams, the average number of contacts any one individual on, on the books will receive in a year has gone down as well. So at the same time that mental health services might be getting better at identifying need for detention, they might have more thinly stretched resources with which to do anything about it, with which to get in early and prevent, do the preventive work that might avert a detention. So those are three things we think might be going on. The next couple of slides are some things which could be really important, but I think we don't have the sort of confirmatory evidence to sort of say categorically they are. And here are some social factors. So austerity, this was a, a popular explanation really. And when you look at the times when the rise has gone up, they've gone up at times of sort of economic depression in the early 90s and since the sort of crash in 2008. So it's easy to sort of say, well, this is obviously what's, what's causing it. I think the relationship between social deprivation and detention rates is really is a complex one. So we saw from Susie's talk that at an individual level, if you come from a deprived area, if you're, if you're sort of socially deprived, you're more likely to be detained. But we've also seen that rich countries detain more people. So what's going on there? The other thing that's difficult about this is at a national level, really what you see about sort of what's happened in terms of deprivation depends what indicators you look at. And they're not all going up. So if you look at unemployment rates, for instance, they're coming down rapidly. If you look at social um, uh, relative poverty, that's also not going up. Funny things happen to relative poverty when median income goes down. So almost you could, uh, national level, you could pick your indicator and, and conclude what you wanted for. What we really need is more good data about what's changing in terms of the people who use mental health services and vulnerable groups of social circumstances. So what are employment rates for, for mental health pa pa patient population? 
what's disposable income for that group, how has that changed over time, and we need a lot more data about that, which we, we haven't been able to sort of source. Um, adult psychiatric morbidity survey would suggest that psychiatric morbidity is going up, so more people are getting unwell. That seems to be more clearly the case for depression and anxiety than it does for psychosis, but it could be the fact that actually there are more people being ill, and of a proportion of them detention, that might be a, a cause. And there are also some sort of demographic changes in society that are consistent with a higher detention rate. So we saw about men and people from black minority ethnic groups having higher risks of detention. And their proportion in the population has gone up since 1988. That also begs the question, though, why? You know, it just begs a new set of questions, really, doesn't it, about why men or why people from being in these groups should be more likely to be detained. But those are changes that have occurred. Increasing culture of risk aversion and safety. So this is a sort of tantalising explanation that could be hugely important, but it's very hard to sort of pin down with any empirical data. I think what we do know is that decision making about risk is, is highly variable. So the qualitative research and vignettes have shown that. And that perceived risk is really important in decisions to detain. We know that in the 1990s and early 2000s, the sort of media um, context of, in which mental health was reported was sort of very... Um, alarmist about sort of danger, so people that high profile cases like Christopher Clunis and Michael Stone sort of created a, a, a culture where, where people were worried about risk and safety. And the Mental Health Act in 2007 actually increased coercion, so it's entirely possible that the sort of people who were coming, practitioners coming into services at that point, are now detaining people because they're working in a framework that's more risk averse and more safe. But, Actually trying to put any number on that or be categorical that that's what's going on is a really hard thing to, to do and I think we can't do safely. Inpatient bed cuts, there's a coincidence, um, inpatient, available NHS inpatient beds have been going down at the same time that detention rates have been going up. My view on the evidence is that there's no good reason to think that that is, is causal. We haven't got any, anything definitive to say that it is, but that's quite a sort of complex and contested debate which we might want to talk more about. And ambitions with substance use. So substance use is really interesting again. So use of substances is going down in the general population over the last decade. But admissions to hospital in the context of using substances is going up. So what's going on there? It could be to do with the type of drugs being used and the strength of, of, of drugs that are available. Or does this also reflect the sort of changing risk culture going on in society? And I think we haven't pinned that down. Just to mention a couple of things we think probably are to do with these. So um, crisis care access to it has expanded massively since the NHS plan in 2000. And I don't think we have good evidence to say that either the quality or accessibility of crisis care is deteriorating now. I think that's unlikely to be the cause of the rise in rates, which is not to say that improving crisis care couldn't help reduce rates uh, from here on. CTOs may be blamed for a lot of things, but I don't think they can be blamed for the rising rate of detentions. I think what we know is that they have very little effect on admission rates, so they don't reduce them, but they don't increase them either. So trying to put this together, our last step was to try to put these together into, into some sort of explanatory models. Okay, two things that models that we could look at. One is regardless of actual need, greater perception of need is being driven by the changing legal culture, clinical culture, and increasing number of people being seen by services. Or there might actually be more need with more people being unwell, which is reflected in more people being seen by, by secondary care. We tried to put all that together in what we call an integrated model. It could be called hedging our bets. Um, <laughs> perhaps mercifully you can't see this now, but do have a look at it. It's, in, it's published in the Mental Health Act Review. And what do we need to do? We need to do loads, basically. We need better data about who is detained. I think it's really important to know, actually, who is it who gets um, into hospital through deprivation of liberty rather than the Mental Health Act? Why? And what is the experience? Does it make a difference to people which, is, which system is used? We need to do what we can about risk, understanding equity, and interventions to try and see what, how we can intervene to improve the quality of risk assessment and safety considerations. And we need to understand what's going on for the lives of people using mental health services and how social factors may influence rates of detention. So I'm really sure that's an agenda for work still to be done. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Do you want to come up, speakers, maybe? Yes. Yeah. All right, so time, we've got, thanks to my colleagues' excellent timekeeping, we've got 14 minutes. 
before our final speaker for questions and also I'm very interested in your thoughts on what we should do or what anyone should do next in terms of research and I think one thing that's very interesting is research that could be done that wouldn't take a vast amount of time to complete whether that's because of an efficient method or because there is data around that could be looked at. Okay, so what are your thoughts? Yeah. If you want to say who you are, just very briefly. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Janet Steele, I'm a carer. Um, I just noticed in the international report the, the rates in Italy were very, very low. Yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to know what, you know, were there any reasons for that? Any research following up on that? Uh, so, Italy is kind of a special case, I guess, in terms of legislation <coughs> and the history of legislation. Uh, it introduced. Um, if the current legislation was introduced in 1978 uh, and focused quite heavily on the institutionalization. I don't, we don't have definitive answers about why Italy is so different uh, to other countries, but I suspect that it has something to do with the alternatives to uh, acute inpatient psychiatric care. That because what we looked at were uh, involuntary hospitalizations, um, so it might be the case that uh, you know, there are people that have been subject to kind of alternatives, but potentially coercive measures, I don't know, uh, that aren't in inpatient uh, hospitals. I guess it's complex, isn't it, though? Because yeah. people also raise issues about whether private care in Italy is adequately captured in the figures. And the south of Italy actually has pretty un undeveloped mental health provision across the board. So it's it's hard to understand where there's quite a lot of alternatives in many parts of the north. So I think the picture is quite hard to entirely understand. But you're right. There are also very low rates in Spain and Portugal, aren't there? Portugal, yeah. Portugal was bottom the last time. Yeah, I thought it was just at. something cultural, you know, there's extended family yeah. and things like that, more support for the yeah. very possible. I think I was yeah. just going to say one one piece of potential future research would be spending time sort of basically asking clinicians, which would unfortunately be working with them to do why they think there are these differences. Okay. And this, this question for Mr. Brennan, the chap in the glasses. Is it not unreasonable to include economics in your study, considering that in 2010, Vince Cable, the business secretary, and George Osborne, the chancellor, decided to choose the life sciences? as a means to offset the UK economy's dependency on financial services. It's very interesting, the uh, upshot, the increase in 2013 of um, incarcerations or detentions coincides with the October the 6th, 2013 headline of some, uh, was it 1,200 uh, people killed by mental patients. When you consider the Rupert Murdoch's son, Lachlan Murdoch, is on the board or was at that time, on the board of GlaxoSmith Klein. I think it's slightly just disingenuous and you're shooting yourself in the foot if you don't include economics into that argument. Is it unreasonable not to include that? I think we've tried to include sort of um, social factors and people's experiences of, of kind of deprivation <coughs> within this model, trying to the factors that we're looking at. So but there's not a kind economics, of I'm talking about economics, not social factors, you detailed that. Yeah. Do you, do you mean that it's a drug company? If you don't include that the in the room, okay. people will just continue to suffer. Mm. People, and then there will be a class of people who continue to take to make money and then say, well, there's a problem, let's do something. You have to look, you know, he who pays the piper, or he or she who pays the piper, pulls a tune. And in the media at the moment, we are going through an extraordinary culture of diagnostic inflation. If you include that in the debate, at least it takes the pressure off people who who may think they are suffering, which but they might not be. It might just be all okay, something they saw in their self relate to the increase in use of services. Yeah, I don't think it's unreasonable to, to include about, that. So it should part of the model. Okay, just a, lots of other people have got their hands up, but I, I think that is one to, to consider. And, uh, George, if, if people don't mind saying <coughs> who they are, if you could do so. Yeah, George. Yeah. Yeah. Given the extraordinary differences internationally, intranational mm. between hospitals within a particular country. I mean, given the lack of clearly 
striking features that might account for this in the work of Johnson. We are left with something that might be called arbitrariness, custom and convention, something which is non systematic. How do you research something which is arbitrary and non systematic? I mean, I think it's a kind of, actually, we were told to take this term out when we put it in our submitted article on the international review, but I think it's a kind of example of an unwarranted variation, isn't it, to at least some extent, that it does seem as though, certainly when we look at the international picture, the extent of the differences, it's very hard to believe that it could be accounted for by clinical need. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting as a, as a kind mm. of research problem. Does it mean that you, you look at every systematic factor, mm. and when you've excluded them all, if there's a huge difference, then it's not systematic, mm. it's Mm. Or is there some way of getting the arbitrariness mm. without uh, the deepest approach? What do you think? I don't well, know. Ask you. <laughs> I think if you did a qualitative work, I think looking at clinicians mm. and how they make those decisions mm. in different hospitals and try and compare those narratives and just sort of try and think like, okay, what led you to make that decision then? So I mean, you look at CTOs, like for example. Mm. Yes. I know. Huge I'm hard to hear. Um, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> shout everyone, yeah. George, yeah. Okay. All right, who had, Claire, you've had your hand up for a while. This lady over here has had her hand up right from the beginning. Okay, well, you're next. But, but, uh, <laughs> you mentioned the HMS, yeah. and, and I was wondering whether that would have um, an initial piece of data in terms of the waves of that survey, um, which are now on to the The APMS is the big national survey of mental health problems that's conducted every seven years or so. Yeah. Uh, it's, na it's national. Yeah. But yeah. Well, the, the data there, isn't it? It's ni not nicely packaged for us, which I think is all we were able to do in this review about looking at kind of do the people who report psychiatric mobility, how are those social circumstances changed over time? But it's, it's a resource there to, to use. What, what jobs do you have? I think people, yeah. people, most people here, standing here, are, are researchers, essentially. Well, I'm also a clinician. Yeah. Yeah. I spread email. Yeah. And Laddie and I are also clinicians and researchers. You were saying somebody had their hands up there. Yeah. I have Go a question on. about the Chris research. Um, so Chris is opt out. And do we know whether or not the people who opted out taking the number of people who were detained or the amount of detentions, were the people who opted out more likely to have been detained or not? Also, did anyone in Camden and Islington opt out because I was a patient there and I didn't even know that my research, that my data was being used? Um, I, don't, I don't know. So I'm based at South London and Waterloo, and um, I think it, there's we have quite a, a wide communication strategy based there. I, I think Camden and Islington have developed nation have tried to mirror what we've done. I'm not sure about the opt-outs um, there. In terms of the opt-outs at uh, South London and Morsley, um, in fact, there are, there are very few. I hope that's because people understand, hopefully, the value of the, the work that can be done with it and not that they don't know about it. Um, I don't think, in terms of the numbers, it would, it would likely have a particular impact at South London Morsey, but I'm not sure in terms of Camden Islington. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry. We can find out. But I don't know. Yeah. Hi. Hi, uh, yeah. Um, <coughs> is, is there research on the, the variations or the proportion or whatever the term is of Anyone know of anything? Oh, the autumn is recorded separately. Yeah. That's one of our recommendations. Yeah. yeah. 
but not currently well recorded. Well, it's not recorded. It's not recorded. Just, just to say, actually, um, so, that you, you, you wouldn't be detained just because you had autism no. No. or those abilities. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just, to let, it's just to let people know because people might yeah. not be aware but of that. But no, it is an important question. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's something that I um, so I've had a, look at, a little look at the literature for children and adolescents, and that's something that comes out a bit more in them, um, but less with less of it in the adult population, adult literature. And obviously, we need to look a bit more. Yeah, so you, uh, children with learning difficulties, there's a high rate of those being detained. I think it will be possible using the if we are able to define it. I think it will be using systems like Chris, which are using kind of electronic. Mm -hmm. Um, health records to have a look at um, that forensically uh, easily within the rule that we that we have used in the answer so far. Yeah. So that could be an important priority for the future, I quite agree it should be. Yeah. I want to ask if you had come across anything in your research about the perceptions of staff who or professionals who are actually involved in admitting mm. people to hospital. Uh, I was thinking particularly in terms of pressures on inpatient beds. Mm. Um, I, I was involved in this work in the trainees committee at the Royal College of Psychiatrists, um, where actually <coughs> trainees who are often involved in admissions were saying that because of the pressures um, on beds, they were often uh, felt under pressure to use the Mental Health Act to ensure that somebody was admitted to be able to access the care that they needed. Um, I might be able to answer that. So when we were doing the review, uh, you know, we talked to lots and lots of different groups, and although there were some people who said, just as you have, Howard, there were other people who said that they felt that they couldn't admit and they delayed admission because there wasn't access to beds. And um, the, one of the questions that we asked was what difference, because we, they were a bit concerned about the, um, the proportion of Section 2s, which, uh, which have seemed to have been increased in the number that have been instituted over the years. And so the question was, what was that about? And whether there was something about a, a lack of available beds that meant that people were much more likely to uh, institute a section two or not likely to admit someone at all. And we had, an, an interesting, we had um, examples given from service users where they felt that they needed to come in voluntarily and then they weren't admitted, weren't admitted, weren't admitted for a long, long time to the extent that by the time they were admitted, they were very unwell and they ended up being sectioned. So um, beds came up. Uh, qualitatively a lot but people said different things I think just one of the things one would hope to be able to look at is the relationship between bed occupancy rates and rates of detention as well whereas if, if it is to do with the sort of squeeze on beds and that's not been looked at in many studies but I don't think we've got any kind of clear evidence that there is a relationship between those two things which one might expect Do you have any data available on contact with crisis teams? Seeing as that's being sold as a sort of alternative to prevent detention, either I guess either individually, um, whether people who have contact with crisis team are more or less likely to be admitted, or geographically, to make variation in the sense of the whole treatment change. Yeah. So there's a little bit of data about that. It's only for some years in, in, during this period about contact with a person with crisis team, which seems to be fairly stable. Um, I think the other thing we, we don't know so clearly is about whether crisis teams can reduce detentions per se really and that's not been demonstrated by evidence or that the quality of crisis teams is related to compulsory admission rates so well, they do have a kind of clear role in, in reducing voluntary admissions how far they're able to reduce detentions anyway I think it's not clear. And it also presents some work this afternoon on sort of clinical interventions and the role they have in terms of preventing <coughs> compulsory admissions. Could I just ask this, to what extent did the studies uh, go to the horse's mouth and actually ask service users and carers why they thought there was an issue? Simon, do you want to well, say something? Well, they did. And there's also yeah. one, of your papers, one of your papers is actually on that. So yeah. Do you want to summarise? It's going to be presented this afternoon. Oh, it's going to be okay. okay. yeah. But we did a review of service users' views, which we'll come to after lunch. But we didn't do much primary research. All the policy research unit work was conducted in under a year, basically. So 
unless there's data there already, we didn't do it. But I think there was quite a wide consultation, wasn't there, Simon, with services? No, it was a bit more than that, but yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. <laughs> All right, I think time for one more before our final speaker before lunch. Yeah. Uh, just for Laddie. Um, so a lot of the research that's done on involuntary uh, psychiatric care looks at clinical populations and forensic populations uh, in isolation and do you think that there's anything that we're missing in the bigger picture by looking at those separately? Yes, is the short answer. Uh, um, particularly for the ME people because um, essentially uh, if you are a black man you, the light, and, you're, and you're in mental health services, the likelihood is that you're going to be in a locked unit or in a forensic unit, all of which are locked obviously. And, um, and it's very unlikely that you'll be in the IAP service, actually. And that's a big problem, and the concern is that no one asks why. We know that um, if you look at young children, we know that black boys are highly likely, much more likely to be excluded from school. But interestingly, and go down, a, and if you get excluded from school, you're much more likely to end up in a, in a criminal population as an adult, yet, Oddly, children, we know that children who get excluded from school at a young age are much more likely to have emotional or behavioural difficulties, and you would expect that they would um, be looked at in terms of a kind of educational psychology stroke, CAMS type way. That doesn't happen for black boys. They go down the forensic route, and uh, they go down the criminal justice forensic route. So there is something, it's, it's an odd thing that we look at them separately when it's very likely that the trajectory towards getting incarcerated, whether it be detained under the Mental Health Act or incarcerated in um, prison, is probably similar. And we have to ask ourselves, why is it that so many black men are criminalised, whether it be in the criminal justice system on its own or criminalised within the mental health system and the forensic services? And so the fact that we're looking at it separately is, it seems an odd thing to me. And we really ought to be looking at things at a much earlier stage and trying to understand a bit better about what's going on. Okay. Right, well, that leads, I think, quite nicely to our next presentation. So thank you very much to... <laughs> so, so, great pleasure to introduce our final speaker for lunch, who's Jackie Dyer, MD, who is, I think, the co-chair of the African Caribbean focus group in the Mental Health Act Review and has quite a lot of other roles, including being chair of Black Thrive of the Black Partnership for Wellbeing. But thank you very much. You've got 20 minutes, including questions, and then we all have to have lunch. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello, Jackie. <laughs> Nobody in the room, right? Somebody in the room? Yes. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. All right, that's all right now. Because then I can be in the room. If you're in the room, I can be in the room. But I don't know where my presentation is. I did. I sent it to this gentleman here. You don't need a presentation, Jackie. I do, I do, I do. I'm not in the best of... Stick on stick at the moment, and I think that that will help me. Um, yeah. So much going on at the moment, isn't there? I don't know if you know that I'm a counsellor in Lambeth, right? That's one of my roles. Um, and I'm a cabinet member for health and adult social care. And it was really interesting a couple of weeks ago that Black Thrive, I'll tell you a bit more about it when my presentation comes on, in a more structured kind of way, but I'm just floating my thoughts here now. <laughs> right? Black Thrive held a community engagement workshop around uh, a focus around prevention. And what we've been striving to do is to almost take the research that you guys do, take the research, take the data to the community. For the community, to be able to, that's it, for the community to be able to uh, work through that data and look at what does this actually mean and what might be the solutions to help us to advance to tackle the issue. And I'll, 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 I want to explain this one a bit more and then you'll see the kind of system to it. And at that workshop, 
there was like, I don't know, over a hundred people. A room perhaps this size. You had people on the tables, sitting around the edges of the, of, of the wall. There was no room in the house. It was like what I call roadblock. Like if you have a party at the party suite, I don't know if you guys have ever been friends at the party. I don't know, that's maybe, yeah, kind of culture, you know. Like, yeah, like a Caribbean party, we used to have house parties, and it'd be like, when you can have it, we're still pushing people into, that, into, the, into the room, but you, they can't really get in, it's one in, one out, and we call it a roadblock. And that really felt like what that community engagement event was, was like because there were so many people there, the energy, the dynamics in the room, the appetite intergenerationally across African and Caribbean communities to engage with the, the issue around preventing severe mental illness within their communities because actually he, she who knows it, feels it. We know that there's a massive issue, but we don't get the data, the research engaging with us at that local level. So anyway, within that context, that was that <coughs> event and it was brilliant. And the following week, I went to a health and well-being board meeting. <laughs> I don't need to say any more. Exactly. <laughs> Enough said, <coughs> shocking. Because actually what you've got is a decision-making arena about the health and well-being of the population that were in the other events, and none of those people were in that room. Do you get the point? Okay, so can we, do I do something here? Um, oh, you can send over there or I can do it for you. Oh, all right then. Okay, so the terms of reference for the, the me so what I wanna do actually is just sort of skim really around some of the points around the Mental Health Act re re Review from an African and Caribbean kind of perspective. But actually, because there's so much rich research that, uh, uh, that has been so, so well done as what you've received this morning and you've been receiving this afternoon. I'm going to take a different kind of direction as to what's the purpose of doing all this research anyway, unless it's to actually make a difference to the populations that we're serving. So I'm going to talk about how, how we might make a difference with the populations that we're serving, particularly those who are experiencing higher levels and ongoing levels of severe mental illness that, and, and an experience of mental health services which consistently talks about dissatisfaction and almost re-traumatizing the detrimental experiences that they're experiencing within the wider uh, society. Or multiple disadvantages, multiple discriminations, etc., etc. Okay, so the terms of reference for the Mental Health Act review that really, for me, led to the necessity for a particular working group that focused on the African Caribbean experience were these two out of the six, which, oh, actually, I did something else there, didn't I? Um, but, yeah, the rising levels of detention under the Mental Health Act and the over-representation <coughs> of people from Caribbean and African communities in mental health inpatient settings, you'll be really familiar with that. And, and but what I want to sort of, just have as an underlying theme, is talk about, within professional spaces, we, 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 we struggle to talk about isms. What, what is it am I talking? Come on, engage with me. We're dealing with a bit of engagement now. What is it? Uh-uh. <laughs> Come on, play with me a little. Is it? Racism. What are the other is it? Sexism. Ageism. The is it, if you don't think of anything else, think of it in terms of the Equality Act and the protected characteristics. That will help you to consider some of the issues if you're not actually familiar with it at present. And I think that this is really difficult, that if we're not engaged with an understanding of the intersectionality of these isms, then we're not really understanding how, how they manifest in decision-making processes where we are aware that biases, whether conscious or unconscious, are actually also informing the decision-making process, informing the thinking that contributes then to differential outcomes for different communities and groups of people. So, in particular, the African Caribbean uh, Working Group wanted to uh, make recommendations that were designed to ensure that people of African and Caribbean descent 
with mental health challenges would receive the treatment and support they need when and where they need it, are treated with dignity and that their liberty and autonomy are respected as far as possible. That means that we have to take on those issues because those are the issues that, uh, what I've just mentioned, that permeate the experience. Please. I'm trying to go through fast because actually I haven't got much time. I'm realising. <laughs> okay. So, um, so some of our core recommendations were about um, the development of the patient and care of race equality framework. This is a hangover from um, the Chris Commission, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, um, actually in this inpatient uh, uh, com commission on inpatient beds, uh, uh, had of which I was a commission member, made this recommendation, which I lobbied for, which is about, as opposed to the workforce race equality standard, empowering the, the, the patient and the carer to have a voice and, of, and influence on the improvement agenda of, 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 of services, so that that feedback is actually valuable. Uh, currently, it's either the, the uh, providers, it's, it's every other view that's valuable except the patient and the carer, particularly when you're coming from um, a, a minority uh, community. So that could otherwise be viewed as an organisational competency framework in terms of race equality. Uh, the other key uh, uh, recommendation was around culturally appropriate advocacy services. Many of the uh, people from the black community say that actually advocacy services don't address their issues. Advocacy services are concerned about the, the paint on the colour of the paint on the walls, concerned about have you got a, a, a bed to sleep in, not concerned about the dynamics and the relationships and the decision making processes that are taking place in relation to your experience in an inpatient setting in relation to your uh, detention under the Mental Health Act that's differentially experienced as a black person, and in particular, African and Caribbean, in particular, even more so, Caribbean um, black men. So where's the voice that, where's the support that actually helps ensure that the equality and human rights agenda in relation to the experience of going into what's supposedly care is actually care. And many of our uh, uh, black communities are desperate for this particular uh, uh, recommendation to be uh, 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 in place because that helps them to feel safer. So the other thing somebody mentioned earlier around community treatment <coughs> as an alternative to um, uh, detention or being within hospital settings. And I suppose that we were able to recognize some of the value through the Mental Health Act Review of CTOs, but actually change the onus of raising the bar for the criteria for people to be detained to, to, for this uh, community treatment order to be issued bearing in mind that the levels of over-representation of people from African and Caribbean communities being, uh, where CTOs are being used is what, 10, 12, 15 times that of the white counterparts. So I'm not really gonna go into any of the other recommendations in detail. What I want to do is to, you can, you can look, to, you have these slides and you can look through them at your leisure, but just emphasizing around addressing endemic structural factors um, in terms of looking at implicit bias in decision making is one of the things that we want to actually uh, 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 pursue. Ensuring that Senny's law, based on uh, the experience over and over of black people in mental health settings getting heavier levels of uh, restraint than, than other counterparts and in many instances um, dying most recently not most recently, because there's been more since, but Olesen and Lewis in Southampton and Maudsley Mental Health Trust, and before that, um, Sean Rigg, which I'll come to in a minute. And absolutely, we have to, and some of the references today, and I think Bryn summarised some of those, the focus, we have to get better at looking at particular research in terms of inequity and inequalities uh, that, that actually must be based on good data and research on ethnicity around these differential experiences. Currently, it, it's actually really very poor. So why do we need a Black Thrive, Lambeth Black Thrive? 
um, because of the disproportionality. Um, so, and, and, and here, from the race disparity order, it says black men are more than 10 times as likely to have experienced a psychotic disorder within the past year as white men. A common mental health disorders such as anxiety and depression, this is the adult psychiatric morbidity survey recently, um, are most prevalent amongst black women. And that was a stark ch change that actually wasn't present within previous uh, psychiatric morbid morbidity uh, surveys. So you can see that there's a real different kind of like, especially wherever black people are located, there's a different experience of uh, mental health than counterparts. And actually when you look at the race disparity audit, you kind of get a sense of that where each of the different areas of the public sector where the public purse is being spent, actually you can see the disproportionality. So in employment, poor outcomes in employment. In, in housing, there's, uh, we're less likely to own uh, 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 property, own our own properties. Higher levels, higher, more, more likely than other groups to be homeless at present. Um, in terms of education, uh, Lade mentioned the high levels of exclusion. I mean, we're, we're, we're in, in, in Lambeth, the prison referral units, the youth offending services, the, uh, <coughs> everywhere where, where, where it's possible to detain and play a large amount of the public person, that's where we're located. Everywhere where it, we're likely to be, can be excluded, that's where we're located. There is an urgent need, and, and the issue also is that nobody's ever really paid any attention to these issues within Lambeth, which is why after the back of the Sean Rigg inquiry, where it spoke to the inquest said that, these are all failing. You stakeholders have basically failed a, psycho, a, a man who was deeply psychotic, psychotic because one, you don't talk to one another, you're not working together in the best interests of your diverse communities, and he slipped straight through the net. So it's like, well, the system's busy thinking it's doing one thing, but what's happening for the people on the ground is completely another thing. And we wanted to actually start addressing that problem. So please forward. So some of the other inequities, step forward. I really wish I had this thing in my hand, you know, because. I could go real faster to it, it's a strange thing. Okay, so this is Lambeth population, 328,000. We've got some serious, wonderful cultural assets in our, in our borough, including the Bull, uh, Black Cultural Archives, please. These are some data around, about Lambeth. Um, so black boys are just under three times more likely to be arrested than white boys. On a daily basis, our black boys talk about the heavy surveillance that they're under from their children all the way through to teenage, all the way to adulthood. They, they have an experience of being uh, uh, treated like criminals from a very early age. Um, black people are six times more likely to be stopped and searched. Uh, one in three children in Lambeth are born into, in, 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 into poverty. Please. So our vision for Lambeth is that, and actually it's a vision for the whole population, wherever we're located, it has to be. Black communities in Lambeth thrive, experience good mental health and well-being, and, and are supported by relevant accessible services which provide the same excellent quality of support for all people, regardless of their race. It is a systematic response to a deeply systemic, entrenched problem. And it's built on the idea that people and organizations from a wide variety of backgrounds are needed to collectively <coughs> tackle mental health inequalities. So it's a platform for partners from statutory organizations, community members, and health specialists, including key a public health specialists, which is why the research uh, academic angle is so important, because it's right at the center of our model. Um, and underpinned by a shared measurement system. So when we think about collective impact, continue, we think about um, this model that was drawn, uh, developed in the N NHS. And what is based upon that no single organization can, can resolve these kind of entrenched issues. You have to work collectively together, but you all have to recognize that the issue is urgent and work collaboratively together on the urgent issue. 
and we share our metrics. So we actually <coughs> have uh, a shared measurement system, it's called, where we have uh, indicators from the police, indicators from the education around, say, like, for example, um, uh, black people's exclusion, um, indicators from, um, from, from health, physical health and, and mental health, uh, and there are various indicators that actually the community have co-produced and co-developed as priorities with the uh, local, local stakeholders. And we have a steering committee which I chair, um, various working groups, um, and partner-driven action. Yeah. So it's so so basically, it's a system and the uh, community working together to address the agenda. Keep going. Luckily, in my borough, it's also um, embedded within our political uh, manifesto. So actually, the whole of the council, the whole of the local authority, has a responsibility to fulfil its manifesto commitment to support Black Thrive. That gives an ability to actually embed this agenda into regeneration, into housing, into health, into social care, right throughout the system because we're taking a systematic approach to address a deeply systemic issue. It's not a little fragment over there of a little plaster to tick a box and then call it George. It's not that one. It's about really addressing what has been for decades something that people haven't given the level of attention to the magnitude of the problem. And because of that, we've actually got a situation, for example, in Lambeth, where we've got communities imploding, imploding. I'm sure you're all aware of the level of, of, of uh, gang violence and knife crime, and is, is it, we're in crisis, right? It's, 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 there's no hiding place now. All made visible, all what hasn't been done before. So now we're attending to the issue. Please continue. So these you'll be distributed and everything. Continue, please keep going. And sorry, and why we think that uh, it's important is about transparent accountability. We have to address the imbalance of power in terms of the voices at the table to influence the thinking. You know, my head of thinking is very different from your head of thinking. But the two heads together maybe can come up with a different kind of imagination and therefore stand a better chance of getting to a different sort of solution. You get me? Yeah, so you can read all this. I've got two minutes, so let's just, <laughs> just get down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep it going. Keep talking. Keep it going. <laughs> so these are our partners and our funders who we work together with our local community. And at last, we have an opportunity to give hope, to share hope to the, the African and Caribbean population of Lambeth who have for so long talked about their dissatisfaction with services who say that they're serving them but don't serve them. They have an opportunity to engage with a process that might take, uh, might help to transform their experiences so that we are so, uh, that they have an opportunity, for example, to be involved in quality improvement initiatives with, within the uh, Mental Health Trust, looking at control and restraint, looking at how to provide better, safe and therapeutic ser uh, services within inpatient se settings, and doing that in a way that's mutually respectful, where actually uh, the, 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 the system is like a bit more closely engaged with who it says it provides for. And there's not this level of total mistrust. We're building healing and trusting relationships. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So, I suggest if you'd really like to ask Jackie anything, you let her get a bit of lunch and then find her and, and ask her. I don't want to keep you from lunch. Okay. So we're going to start again very promptly at thirteen twenty uh, twenty-five past one, and there's some lunch out in the foyer. Meanwhile, thank you.